Welcome to Caserta's Data Intelligence Series. In this series, we talk about what it takes to go from a good data and analytics leader to a great one. We'll share with you the tools and methodologies you need to build better, faster, and more robust, as well as strategies and frameworks to generate more revenue and grow your business. Featuring some very special guests and experts to inspire you and give you advice and direction on your data journey. And now, introducing your host, Caserta Data and Analytics Evangelist and VP Marketing, Remy Rosenbaum. Hey everyone, and welcome to today's episode in Caserta's Data Intelligence web series. And today we're going to talk about how to ensure data quality in the modern data ecosystem. This is part three in a six part series all about how to operationalize data governance. And data ingestion, you know, it used to be a really time consuming process. However, today's modern data ecosystems like data lakes really make it quick to ingest the data easily. And this speed is both a blessing and a curse. And it's because the data quality is often not well checked, which could lead to poor business decisions based on the poor data. And then lose, uh, users will lose trust in the data. And once that trust is lost, it is really difficult to reestablish. And this applies not only to you know, smaller businesses, but even the leading businesses and organizations in the world, you know, sometimes they exclude data quality from their data governance strategies. That's a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. So what are we going to do about that? Uh, we have two presenters today to explore, explain, and teach you all about how to ensure data quality in the modern data ecosystem. So who do we have today? First up, we have Dr. Michael Dirch, who is a data engineer and scientist with Caserta with a demonstrated history of creating solutions in multiple industries and verticals. He's skilled in software development, data engineering, data, scientists, uh, data science, and technology management. And he truly enjoys and has a passion for helping clients find solutions to their specific needs. And next up, we have Eric Linden, who is a senior solution architect with Caserta with more than 30 years of data intelligence experience across multiple industries as well. Uh, in enterprise data warehouse, data mark design, and all kinds of business intelligence and big data implementations. Uh, he has done many cloud uh, migrations and data architecture implementations for Caserta clients. Uh, so thank you for joining us guys. And uh, Michael, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Remy. And thank you all for joining this webinar. So we'll be discussing, as Remy said, data quality, why it's important, and how to achieve high data quality. Many organizations assume that their data has high quality, but what if that isn't the case? As the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out, or as they say in the UK, rubbish in, rubbish out. And when data loses its quality, then oftentimes users will lose their trust in that data. And as Remy said, when they lose that trust, sometimes it's really hard to gain that trust back. So how do we know if we have quality data, if it's high quality? How do we measure that quality? What governance needs to be in place to ensure that we have high quality data? How do we effectively communicate the value of improved data quality to senior management? So these are some of the questions that we hope to answer in today's webinar. And throughout the, this presentation, we will be showing some statistics that were gathered from surveys of over 500 organizations. So why do we need data quality? There was a major hotel chain that was having significant troubles with their food services inventory, and especially with over-ordering perishable items. So oftentimes they were having to throw away massive amounts of unused food. And when they were reviewing their product data, they soon discovered why this was the case. It turns out that they had been double ordering tomato sauce because it was entered in their system twice as ketchup with a K and ketchup with a C. In this case, while it was costing the hotel chain money, it's a relatively benign situation. But there are cases where data quality issues can lead to more serious consequences and even disasters. So talking about data quality at a high level, most organizations don't consider or treat their data as an asset. In fact, less than 20% of respondents said that they 
that they treat their data as an asset. When your data is not treated as an asset, oftentimes this means that it's being treated as a liability. So we think about the cost to store it, the cost to maintain, to gather, what is the legal risk, um, the implications of GDPR and CCPA and other uh, regulations compliance. So when we don't consider data as an asset, then we don't often have it at the forefront of our mind. And in fact, only 50% of respondents said that they have data as part of their enterprise strategy. So the organization's not thinking about data, they're not focused on data. That means that they aren't considering data metrics or publishing, publishing those data metrics, having dashboards. They're not really thinking about what their data quality is. And instead, it's better if data becomes an asset and data quality is part of that. And when data becomes a part of an enterprise strategy, then these organizations are making significant use of their data three to four times more often. How can data be used? So often data is used in grid reports, in spreadsheets. Um, it's used for descriptive analysis. In other words, what happened? What's going on in our organization? Few depend on and trust the data enough to really let it drive the decision-making process or to transform the business in a meaningful way, way, to do prescriptive analytics. When data can be used to empower the organization, then it can be used to transform it, to improve the business process, um, to improve strategic insights and decision-making, and to transform products and services. And we found that organizations with a chief information officer who's responsible for their data are only half as likely as organizations who have a chief data officer to be doing advanced analytics, to be doing machine learning, data science. So having a, an executive who's really focused on data really makes a difference in how the organization uses and employs that data. This is, what is data doc democratization? That's often a, a question we hear from people who aren't familiar with it. Uh, data democratization means that everybody in the organization has access to the data and that there aren't any gatekeepers who are creating a bottleneck from getting access to the data. As previously mentioned, less than 20% of organizations really treat their data as an, op as an asset. And 40% of organizations report that there is hoarding or that the data is shared begrudgingly. Why does that happen in an organization? Well, it's easy to keep data siloed within a group because providing the data to the entire organization, making sure that it's high enough quality actually takes some effort. And so because of that effort, sometimes people don't want to share the data, or maybe they're afraid of becoming technical support for their data. Maybe they're afraid that the data will get misused or that something will be misrepresented. Or maybe even the organization or the group within the organization knows that there are data quality issues. And by not sharing the data, they can kind of sweep under the rug any data, data quality issues that they have. And there are also other internal politics and, and reasons why uh, data might not get shared, which I'm sure that you can imagine. So when, when this happens, organizations are really missing out on the potential opportunities that they would have to leverage their data, including using it for data monetization. Poor data quality can lead to inefficient decisions at best, and at worst, it can lead to the wrong decisions, which costs the organization time and money. And with that, Poor data quality means that you can't leverage the data, meaning sharing it or selling it outside of the organization for further monetary opportunities. And with that, Remy, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction there on data quality. Now we will touch just briefly on data literacy as it's related to data quality. Data literacy is a, a broad topic that really could be a webinar on its own but we will just touch on it briefly here. What is data literacy? Well, broadly, it's knowing what data assets your company has and how are they available throughout the organization. 
Before an organization can measure data quality, they really need to have a, a solid inventory of the data assets that are at hand. It makes logical sense that you need to know what you have before you can measure it. Once in it, the inventory is in place, the next logical step will be looking at the quality and the trustworthiness of the data. I think one of the most telling things on here is that we see that uh, fewer than 40%, which means more than 60% of the respondents were not trained in any tool besides Excel. This is a very recurring situation that we've seen in numerous clients. Not only in many situations is Excel the only tool that's being used for reporting and analytics, but the distribution methods that go along with that are also very cumbersome. We have literally had clients who are sending 30 meg or larger attachments in emails to dozens or hundreds of users. Those attachments are large Excel files that contain both the data as well as the report. When a, when a user receives that email, they open the email, some of them copy and paste information that they find important. They may add other information from other systems, again, in Excel, and then send that spreadsheet off to, to additional people. And that process continues on and on. We've also seen where Excel is the system of record for information. It could be reference data. It could be data mappings from like local chart of accounts to a global chart of accounts or it could be departmental uh, groupings or hierarchies that are specific to a given department. Consumption of that really requires tribal knowledge. Nobody knows what it is. It's not governed. There's no quality checks. Further evidence of treating data as an asset. We hear companies all the time who say that they want to be data driven. They want to be data centric or they're a data company but they're not measuring the data's value. If you're not measuring the data's value, you can't make that evolutionary jump to be a data company. This is further evidence of companies with a lack of treating data as an asset. We hear that companies want to be data-driven or data-centric, but if only 21% are measuring the impact of data quality improvements, they are incapable of making that evolutionary jump to be a data-driven or data company. Let's talk about specific DQ challenges. The following DQ measures were really put together in relation to a warehouse or a data lake or a modern analytics environment. However, it's important to note that repairs identified by this data quality measures should be done as far upstream as possible, back to the original source system of record. Obviously, if it's third party data that's being consumed and the system of record is not within the company's domain, then the original data should be maintained and the corrected data should be put into the analytics environment. So data quality problems, it's not new and they can be catastrophic. If you think back to 1912, there was an unsinkable ship that set sail on its maiden voyage. Right? It, the data said that it was unsinkable. The data said that there were no icebergs. The data said that the, the ship could be turned before it hit the iceberg. The data said that there was enough lifeboats for everyone. And we all know the story of the Titanic and what happened. A huge financial loss, even a bigger loss of human life, all because either the data was wrong or the people didn't trust the data thinking that the data was wrong. Fortunately, most of us today are not dealing with DQ problems that are gonna cause a loss of human life. What is different today? Well, a big difference today is we have the capability today to measure data, to measure data quality and to communicate that. But also with the proliferation of data and the movement of data from system to system, there's also a much higher chance of data problems. Data can be measured across various categories. I'm listing six categories here. In the subsequent slides, we will go into additional detail on each of these six categories. The first category is consistent data, meaning that the data is consistent across multiple systems. We, we see issues with this frequently. For example, your marketing system may have a different email than your financial system for the same customer. Issues with consistency like that within the master data or within reference data 
prompt many companies to look at MDM or reference data solutions. In fact, there's a future webinar that speaks directly to the master data issues. One thing to remember here is that this is not a technology solution exclusively. The business needs to agree on a standard definition and a source of truth for the data. The second one is accurate data. Most commonly, this is what people think about when they hear about data quality. What is accurate data or bad data? Well, I would give you some specific examples from some clients that we've worked with. Often, especially in older systems, fields are stored as strings and there's no verification done upon data entry. So we've had February 30th dates, obviously. There's never been a February 30. We'll have uh, alphabetic characters embedded into fields that should be numeric. We've seen start times after completion times. What does that mean? I can give you a specific example at a manufacturing client where data was coming off of a piece of machinery that, from the manufacturing plant. And the job time and the, the job start time and the job stop time, the job stop time or completion time was earlier than the start time. So unless the person jumped into a DeLorean and went back in, back in time, that's impossible. We also see non-sensible ranges or non-sensible values. What if you have a customer, a current customer, and their birth date is 1850? Obviously, they're, they're not that old. Um, another example from the manufacturing client, a piece of machinery had a theoretical maximum output of 25,000 pieces per hour but yet the data came in and said that it did 200,000 pieces in two hours. That's 100,000 per hour. Obviously nonsensible, impossible to occur. Lastly, data dependency collisions. What are data dependency? Dependency collisions. I will go back again to our manufacturing client. I would get a, a job ran on a single piece of machinery and it created 30,000 pieces, 30,000 units. However, when you go to the scheduling software, you see that no one was scheduled to work on that machine at that point in time. So there's a dependency issue between the two systems that are causing a data quality issue. Change audit data. Source systems typically only have the current value about things. They might have a user ID and a timestamp of the last of the most recent change, but they won't tell you what changed you can't look at previous data, nor can you see a history of those changes or a version of those changes. What if you're only pulling the data on a nightly basis and there's intraday changes that need to be captured? Also, what if there's a requirement to know point in time, meaning this report ran a month ago and I need to create the report as it looked a month ago, but I only have current data. So capturing quality challenges around that are key to implementing the correct solution. Unique data. When you hear unique data, typically people think about duplicate rows. And that's certainly one of the examples. The job ran twice, the file came in twice, we got duplicate rows. However, it could be just an understanding of how to use the data. For example, data could be snapshot meaning every day I take a snapshot of the data so you can do point in time. If a person doesn't supply the correct snapshot date, it will appear as if they're getting duplicate data back. Some source systems will also do physical deletes that might get missed in the analytics warehouse. That's a huge problem where physical deletes are occurring and change data capture only gives you inserts and updates. Lastly, Source system updates can at times update fields that uniquely identify the row in the source system. So in the analytics environment, it now looks like a new row. Specific example on this was a client where their purchase orders in their ERP system, there was a column that could be updated and it, it was a column that helped identify a unique row. So as that value would change from a four to a three to a two to a one, all four of those records would look like new records in the warehouse and would look like dupes, duplicates on, on reporting. Lastly is timely data. It's probably the most overlooked D quality measure, measure there is. 
users frequently have no visibility into when the data was last loaded. Financial data doesn't have yesterday's sale or part of yesterday's sales is, is what happens when they run the report. And they ask, well, is, is this data old? Is this data stale? DQ metrics need to be published so that the users know what the service level agreement is around the timeliness and also that and also to communicate what the last loaded timestamp was for that specific piece of information. That cannot be at a, at a data warehouse or an analytics layer grain. It has to be specific to a, a table or perhaps even a metric because not all data is loaded with the same frequency. Traditionally, nightly batch was sufficient for most analytics and reporting. However, Modern day organizations are now moving much more towards streaming data, which captures real time and intraday changes. So what's in it for us if we measure data quality? Well, 50% claim they measure data quality, but only 18% say it's actually a major focus. That means that 80 plus percent are not looking at data quality as a major focus throughout their organization and in their culture. That number pretty well matches up to 72% of the orgs that regularly argue about what data is correct. We see this frequently. Once people are arguing over what data is correct and what data is incorrect, trust is lost. And it has been mentioned a couple times now, once trust is lost on the data, it is extremely difficult to get that trust back, which makes it extremely difficult to run an effective data-driven organization. What are some key benefits of measuring data quality? Well, first off, it's much less likely for D quality issues to affect financials, have serious effect on financials. Bad data can lead to bad decisions. That can affect your bottom line. And in some cases, it can, e it can even potentially lead to litigation. Another benefit, an org is far more likely to have a data science team. An organization with a data science team can provide better insight and provide, which will give the company a competitive advantage in the marketplace. The third benefit of measuring data quality is leveraging those assets better than your competitors do. In fact, from our research, five times better for folks who are doing a good job of measuring data quality. However, organizations that are looking only partially at data quality, specifically measuring accuracy and completeness of data, only leverage their data two times as well compared to five times as well for a more mature data quality practice. Lastly, those without a formal data quality are much less likely to claim that they are leveraging the data in a variety of ways. What is the common thread throughout everything we've heard here in today's webinar? Data governance. Data governance is the framework for establishing and enforcing policy and authorities to ensure the enterprise data and information. The key here is that they have enforcement authority. This can include enforcement of quality, consistency, accuracy, timeliness. Again, it is a collaboration of IT and the business and cannot succeed without either working hand in hand. Organizations without a data governance, especially a mature data governance program, are three times more likely to suffer from debilitating data quality issues. We thank you very much for your time today. We hope this information was insightful to you. I will mention that a consulting partner such as Caserta can be extremely valuable in helping your organization on its data journey through literacy, data catalog, data quality, and data governance. Caserta has a proven track record of working with companies, partnering with companies to help them better understand their data and leverage these solutions for a competitive advantage. Uh, thank you, Eric. And uh, if anyone has any further questions, please ask them in the questions panel on the right. Uh, so let's jump into the questions asked. 
the first one we have is uh, how do you measure data quality for streaming data? I'll take that. So for, for streaming data, really the criteria for data quality aren't changing. So the completeness, are there empty values, uh, the ratio of data errors, uniqueness, um, timeliness, uh, email bounce rate for, for marketing, these criteria aren't changing. But what does change is how you're going to implement, um, how you're going to apply it. So with a streaming da data source, some things can be done in line while it's streaming. So we can look for complete, completeness, are there fields missing? But there are other things that maybe make more sense to handle um, in a batch and a nightly reconciliation. So there can be maybe some bifurcation there and how it's applied, but the criteria stay the same. Um, all right, our next question is, we've identified a lot of data quality issues at our company. What is the quickest way to get started to resolve these issues? Eric, you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. So the, the, the key to the resolution is to establish your data governance practices and put together a data governance council. Um, keep in mind that IT cannot unilaterally resolve these issues. When there's, when there's collisions, when there are uh, data items that are not consistent from one system to the next, like an email from marketing and an email from finance for the same person, the governance council makes the decisions around the, the quality. Um, the easiest way to get started on that is to identify a certain domain of data or a department of data and start with that and then continue to build up to an enterprise, uh, an enterprise council and enterprise governance. Okay, thank you for that. Um, all right, our next question is, uh, like the saying goes, if we don't measure something, we cannot manage it. Uh, what are some tips to communicate the data quality measurements? I'll take that. Uh, you'll take that, Michael. Yeah, I'll take that. So, it doesn't make, yeah, like you're saying, it doesn't make much sense to measure things and then not to communicate it. So how are we going to communicate it? Typically you would do that through some, well, first of all, you need to capture those metrics in a database so that they're recorded. And then once you've recorded that in a database, then they're queryable. Um, you can make an online dashboard to present that for, for times when you notice that there are more egregious data quality issues, it probably makes sense to have an email notification go out to key individuals. Um, that you would also maybe have an executive dashboard for high level um, insight into data quality. Maybe, maybe there are reasons why executive management would be interested in certain data quality issues. Yeah, just to add a little bit to that, um, there's, <laughs> I've had several, several uh, clients where we put together a data quality dashboard. Uh, I mentioned some of the data quality issues at a previous manufacturing client. We had a comprehensive dashboard that applied all of those data quality checks and would advise senior management in the morning that, you know, that this job ran on machine A, but nobody was scheduled on machine A, or this, this, this job, according to the numbers, greatly exceeded the OEM capability that that machine had. And literally at a transactional level, they were notified along with tagging of the data quality because at, at times there was more than one data quality issue on a single piece of data or on a single record. Um, and that went out on a daily basis in a red, <clears throat> yellow, green, uh, uh, you know, stoplight type um, dashboard so that they would immediately gravitate to the, the red items and take action. That's uh, definitely a, a good, uh, a good uh, example. Um, and uh, here we have our last question that we have time for. And if anyone has a further question, we will respond to you via email. Uh, so our last question is, and this is a good one. Uh, we have data quality issues at our firm and we're currently looking into both Alation and Calibra as data catalog providers. Uh, do you guys recommend implementing a data catalog before starting the data quality initiative? Good question, and not, not necessarily. You can, 
depending depending on your specific requirements, the size of the company, and and how far you are down the line of looking at products like uh, Alation or Calibra, um, I would say that they can be done uh, separately or they can be done in in parallel. The key is you will need to start with some form of a catalog, but it it could be a manual inventory. It doesn't have to be something as formal as Alation or Calibra in before before uh, starting on your data quality work. All right, excellent. Uh, did you want to chime in, Michael? That's a great answer. All right. Well, thank you guys for uh, presenting today. These are great presentations. And uh, thank you to the audience. And I will see you next time at the next episode of the Caserta Data Intelligence Web Series. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank Thanks. you, Remy.